Good morning, friends, and a happy Sabbath to you. We welcome you to our Revelation, our Looking Revelation seminar, or series, rather. And uh, we are glad that you joined us. And we hope that you are being blessed by these presentations. Um, the Bible lessons in the morning and in the afternoon, we have the health section. Um, personally, I've been blessed by them, and I hope that you are receiving the same blessings or even more as well. Today, we are going to look at the Church of Smyrna, the Church of Smyrna. And before we actually go into that, I just want us to read a, a, a line, a passage from the book Acts of the Apostles by Ellen G. Ward concerning the seven churches. I know that uh, there has been a, an introduction of the seven churches. I'm just going to repeat this line to make sure that we don't lose focus, we get the big picture. <clears throat> this is from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 57, and the page is 585, paragraph three. It says, the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time. While the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. So here we learn that the message or the messages extend to the end of time. So when we read, when we studied um, about the church of Ephesus, it was describing the condition of the church during that time period, but the message extend even to our time. So the same applies to the following churches, the message to the following churches, like the church of Smyrna that we're going to look at today. Uh, before we actually go into that, let us take a short word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your kindness. We thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you for the gifts of life and for giving, this up, for giving us this opportunity to be studying your word this morning. Um, looking at the book of Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 11, the message to the church of Smyrna. Help us to get the message that you have in it for us. In Christ we pray and for his sake. Amen. All right. So we are going to look at the <clears throat> message to the Church of Smyrna. It's found in the book of Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 to verse 11. This is, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. But thou art rich. And I know the blessing of them who say they are Jews and are not, but are, are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that he may be tried, and he shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Verse 11. He that, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes, shall not be heard of the second death. So this is the message to the church of Spain. It's very interesting. <clears throat> Christ has nothing against the church of Spain. He has no rebuke to the church of Spain. The only church, one of the few churches <clears throat> that don't have a rebuke. Um, actually, it's the first church here that we see it doesn't have any rebuke toward it. Um, may, only, may only be the one here um, so far of the two that have been covered, Ephesus and Smyrna. So it is the first one that, has, that doesn't have that. <clears throat> now, where does the word Smyrna come from? Um, the word Smyrna, according to the seven epistles of Christ, page 44, it says, Smyrna is synonymous with myrrh, which was an aromatic substance used sometimes as a healing ointment, but more especially for embalming the dead. And according to Psalm 45, um, verse 8, <clears throat> in terms of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6, Mary seems to have been the special perfume of Christ as king and bridegroom. Let us just look at those two verses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, those two verses, let us look at them and um, see what they say. Psalm 45, beginning Psalm 45 and looking at verse 8. He says in verse 8, all thy garments 
smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. Um, so it's talking about that substance. It was used by royalty. And then let's go to Sons of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6. See the same substance here being used. Sons of Solomon, chapter 3, and you're looking at verse 6. Uh, the book of Canticles is basically Sons of Solomon. It says in chapter 3, verse 6 of the book of Sons of Solomon. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of small, perfumed with fear, and frankincense with all powers of the nation? And when you look at the context, it's talking about the bridegroom. So uh, <clears throat> these are talking about Christ, you know, it's a depictions of Christ. And uh, both as king and as a bridegroom, he has, you know, this special perfume made of this substance. And one of the chief ingredients of miracles made by crushing and dealing a plant of the same name. Um, this stony plant or tree grows about eight or nine feet high, just above two meters. And it's found in Arabia and to some extent in Palestine. It is very bitter to the taste, but has a fragrant odor. And the more the plant is crushed and bruised, the greater the fragrance. The name's manner, therefore, indicates suffering and persecution, which prove a blessing. Remember, when you take this plant and then you crush it more, it produces greater fragrance. So if you want to get more out of it, you crush it even more and more. It's like the more you um, subdue it and submit it to force, the more it smells nicely. So the name is taken. Um, so, so just from the name, we can see that the church of Smyrna would be crushed by cruel persecutions, but as a result of her sufferings, it would be anointed for a death and burial that would end in a resurrection and a renewal of life. Although the afflictions would be bitter to the victim because the plant is, is, is self is bitter, they result in releasing or realizing to the world rather the perfume of heaven. Although the afflictions that this church would go through are bitter, they would result in releasing to the world the perfume of heaven. The world will behold the grace of Christ working in human beings. We have never seen such faith. These people are being crushed and persecuted, yet they stand firm for their feet. And by that, the world or those who behold, there has become one. They are one to who? To Christ. So that's uh, what we see here about the name, the origin of the name of Smyrna. Let's look at how Jesus introduced himself to the church of Smyrna. In verse 18, the one, the one that we read, he introduces himself as the first and the last. That's point number one. Point number two, he introduces himself as, as he which was dead and is alive. So <clears throat> this is very, very interesting. When you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Christ introduces himself in a very interesting way as well. Uh, <clears throat> here. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is for to come. So Christ introduces himself as the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, denoting that he is God. At the beginning of your trial, Christ is God. At the end of your trial, Christ is still God. He is the A and the Z of your life. That is what we see. Alpha is the first um, <clears throat> letter in the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last. Um, letter in the um, Greek alphabet. So that is why I use the English one, A to Z. So Christ is noting in this introduction that he is God. That's the first thing that we see. <clears throat> he also identifies himself as one which was dead and is alive. This attests to his resurrection. When you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And not only that, 
and have the keys of hell and of death. This also shows that <clears throat> he has power to resurrect those who are killed. So just from the introduction, Christ is talking about himself being God. And one of the attributes of God is that God is a giver of life. And not only that, but Christ is that, yes, I am God and I was dead and it's alive. I experience what human beings go through, which is death. But now I'm alive. And as God, I have power over death. I can resurrect whoever I will resurrect. So Jesus introduced himself as the author of life. And his authority and power to resurrect. As he shows in the book of John chapter 11, verse 28. John chapter 11, verse 28. Let's just read it for a friend's sake. John chapter 11, verse 28. He says in John chapter 11, verse 28. We'll read it from there, actually. <clears throat> and when he... Um, let's just go a bit, a bit uh, backward. We will end at verse 28. Verse 24. Um, okay. Verse 23. This is, this is what was going on when Jesus was um, at uh, Bethany, where Lazarus was, where Lazarus died. <clears throat> verse 23. Verse 6 unto, her, unto Mary, uh, uh, <clears throat> unto Martha rather, thy brother shall rise again. A mother said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Just said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Um, I wanted to basically um, emphasize verse 25. I'm going to correct <coughs> verse 28 there as a reference so that uh, you get to um, get a proper reference. So Christ introduces himself as one who is the resurrection and the life. And he says that he that believes in him, though he die, or though he were dead, yet shall he live. So here we see that Christ, when he introduces himself to the church of Smyrna, he's emphasizing the fact that he's the author of life as God. And has authority and power to resurrect. He has authority and power to give life to those who have been killed for his sake. To those who have been killed for his name. To those who have been killed for righteousness sake. These are the things that you should expect in the church of Smyrna. Persecution that results in God's people dying for their faith. That is what you should expect. Um, just from the introduction, we should expect that. Now let's see. <clears throat> this is for special Christmas um, series B, uh, 19, uh, page 23. Uh, Paragraph one, from Jesus is our life a derived. In him is life that is original, unborrowed, underived life. In us there is a streamlet from the fountain of life. In him is a fountain of life. Our life is something that we receive, something that the giver takes back again to himself. If our life is hid with Christ in God, we shall, when Christ shall appear, also I appear with him in glory. And while in this world, we will give to God in sanctified service all the capabilities he has given us. So Christ, when he promises that he is the resurrection and the life, when he promises that he is the one who has power to give life, when he pronounces that he's beginning and the ending, the first and the last, when he pronounces that he is he the one, he's the one who has done his life for him, He's encouraging those who have believed in his name to be faithful. Not only that, but in sanctified service to render unto God all the capabilities that he has given them. This is what you should expect from the church of Spain. Christ now moves on to commend them. Verse 9, he says, I know your works and tribulation and poverty. Three things that Christ is seen on. Their works, their tribulation, and their poverty. Now, this, the last two are very, very interesting. Tribulation results in poverty. Material poverty, that is. 
when people are being persecuted, they run around, they run away from their home, they run away from the uh, more long-term permanent settlements and they move about. So they can't carry everything that they have. They can't carry the, all their money. And they are not told you are going to invade your space on such and such a time. So they end up being destitutes. Christ is that, but you are rich. Though you have poverty, there's something that you are rich in. This is very, very interesting. The book of James chapter two talks about a certain kind of poverty and a certain kind of wealth. James chapter two. Verse five. Hagen, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and as of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? So they were poor materially, but they were rich in faith. That is why Christ is the but thou art rich, a contrast. Though you are materially poor, though you are physically poor, but spiritually you are rich. And this, I know the blessing of them which say they are Jews. So Christ knows the work, their works, their tribulation, their poverty, are they, um, their spiritual rich, uh, wealth. And also he knows the blessing of them which say they are Jews, but are not. And who are they? They are the synagogue of Satan. So from this, we learn that this church was going through a persecution or tribulation and that it was materially poor, as I have explained earlier on. We know that tribulation, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 9, it comes as a result of the weight, being faithful to the weight. John was put in prison for what purpose? He says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for what? For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So being faithful to the word, preaching the word faithfully and living according to the word of God leads to that kind of persecution or that kind of tribulation. And tribulation, we are told in the book of Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to verse 5, and also the book of James chapter 2, chapter 1, verse 2 to verse 4, that it produces patience and patience produces hope. So although they have this tribulation that, you know, it ends up working for them in such a way that Christ sees them as precious before his eyes, such that you know, he compares them to this plant that produces an, a pleasant odor, a perfume, when it is crushed. How many of us would be faithful so that when you are crushed, we still praise the Lord? When you are crushed, we praise him more and more. When you are crushed, we show that Carried of Christ more and more. Christ wants us to get to that point. You know, for us, when we're Christ, when we go through some tribulation, we start swearing and screaming and screaming and kicking and blaspheming God. Yes, God, why? Why? Why are you doing this to me? Instead of praising Him. This patience the one that is produced by tribulation is one of the identifying marks of God's saints, of God's remnant. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, talks about the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God. We should expect from this church then a people who reflect Christ's character. That is what you should expect from the church of Spain. That is what is being here uh, portrayed. We read from Fox's Book of Martyrs. In the third persecution, plainly in the second, a man, a learned and famous, a learned and famous, seen the lamentable sort of Christians and moved therewith to pity, wrote to treasure, certifying that there were many thousands of them daily put to death, of which none did anything contrary to the Roman laws with your persecution. Open quote, the whole account they gave their crime or error, whichever it is to be called, amounted only to this vis. That they were accustomed 
to a stated day to meet before daylight and to repeat together a set form of prayer to Christ as a God and to bind themselves by an obligation not to indeed to commit wickedness, but on the contrary, never to commit theft, robbery or adultery, never to falsify their way, never to defraud any man, after which it was their custom to separate and reassemble to partake in common of, in, in common uh, of a harmless meal. So after that, they will you know, reassemble to eat together and, and say that it was a harmless meal. So you were just, it was just you were describing, Planet Singer was just uh, describing how Christians were living. And these are people, you see that they were pious people, the way they're described. This describes the persecution under Imperial Trajan in 108 AD. It was during this persecution that he made the following Imperial decree. Open quote, anyone who denies that he's a Christian and actually proves that this by worshiping our God is pardoned on repentance, no matter how suspect his past may have been. So they were saying that people should renounce Christianity. And that is how they will save their lives. They renounce Christianity and worship their idols, their gods, then they are pardoned. This was under Trajan, 108 AD. Trajan being succeeded by Adrian, the latter continued this that persecution with as much severity as his predecessor. So Adrian, who succeeded Trajan, continued with that. About this time, Alexander, Bishop of Rome, with his two deacons, we might have, as were uh, Quirinius and Hennis, with their families, a Zenon, a Roman nobleman, and about 10,000 other Christians. And in Mount Ararat, many were crucified, crowned with thorns, and his peers ran into their sides in imitation of Christ's passion or Christ's death. Eustachius, uh, a brave and successful Rom Roman commander, was by the imperial order to join in an adulterous sacrifice to celebrate some of his own victories. But his faith, being a Christian in his heart, was so much greater than his vanity that he nobly refused it. Enraged at the denial, the ungrateful emperor forgot the service of this skillful commander and ordered him and his whole family to be martyred. So this was happening during the time of the period of the Church of Smyrna, which basically um, you know, stretches from 101 AD, 101 AD to 313 AD, or 300, yeah. Um, <clears throat> then followed another persecution under Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, nicknamed Caracalla in 162 AD. We read that the cruelties used in this persecution were such that many of the spectators shuddered with horror at the sight and were astonished at the intrepidity, intrepidity of the sufferers. Like the, those who were suffering, they were, they shocked them in the sense that, you know, they were calm and they took it in a way that it's unnatural. They responded to the persecution in an unnatural way. When you read in history, they sang hymns, they offered prayers while they were being persecuted. Some of the martyrs were obliged to pass with their already wounded foot, feet, over thorns, nails, sharp shells, etc., and other projectiles upon their points. Others were scratched until their sinews and veins lay bare. And after suffering, the most excruciating treasures that could be devised, they were destroyed by the most terrible and horrible deaths. Then followed another persecution under Emperor Severus in 192 AD. Severus, having been recovered from a severe fit of sickness by a Christian, became a great favor of the Christians in general. But the prejudice and fury of the ignorant multitude prevailing, obsolete laws were put in execution against the Christians. The progress of Christianity alarmed the pagans and they revived the stale calumny of placing accidental misfortunes to the account of his professors in AD 192. So it continued even under this uh, imperial Who was 
we are told that um, a Christian helped him to recover from a severe fit of sickness. Because of public pressure, he gave in and revived the persecution. Then followed that of Imperial Gaius, Julius, Vemus, Averus, Maximus in 235 AD. So this was the time of Maxim, Maxim Minas in Cappadocia. The president, uh, Seremianus, did all he could to exterminate the Christians from that province. And during this persecution, <clears throat> raised by uh, Maximinus, numberless Christians were slain without trial and buried indiscriminately in heaps, sometimes 50 or 60 being cast into a pit together without the least decency. The tyrant Maximinus, dying in 238 AD, was succeeded by Gordian, during whose reign and that of his successor Philip, the church was free from persecution for the space of more than 10 years. But in 249 AD, a violent persecution broke out in Alexandria at the instigation of a pagan priest without the knowledge of the empire. So this is very, very interesting history. Now the church went through the cycles of persecution from those who were against the religion of Christ. There followed other waves of persecution, such as the ones under Imperial Decius in 249 AD, who was best known as the instigator of the first thorough going persecutions of the Christians. And then we had Imperial, Imperial Valerian in 257 AD, who persecuted Christians for three and a half years. And then Imperial Lucius Domitius Aurelian in 274 AD. So these are some of the persecutions that followed um, afterwards. Now, this church had among its it, those who claimed, according to verse 9, the one, the one which, was, which we just read, those who claimed to be Jews but were of the synagogue of Satan. They claimed to be Jews, but they were the synagogue of Satan. Now, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 has a very interesting usage of the word Jew, showing who a real Jew is or what a real Jew is. Romans chapter 2 in a reading of verse 29. Romans chapter 2. Book of Romans. And we are looking at chapter 2. But he is a Jew, which is one in what? And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Verse 20 For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. So here we are told who is a Jew and who is not a Jew. One is a Jew outwardly and has that circumcision of the flesh. Paul is in Romans chapter 2, verse 20 says that that is not a Jew. But who's a Jew? Verse 29, the one who's a Jew in what is the one whose circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And in the book of Galatians 3, verse 29, we're told that if you are uh, Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. In John chapter 8, verse 39 and 40, Christ talks about Abraham's works. Now, those who are Abraham's seed, they do the works of Abraham. So the Jew in this sense is the one who does the works of faith. The one who has faith, just like Abraham, the faith that Abraham manifested, they manifest the same. That is what a Jew is. So there are those who claimed to be Christians, but they were not. They were not Christians. This is coined as blasphemy because it's the, I know the blessing of them who say they are Jews, but are not. Instead, they are what? The synagogue of Satan. So they are taking the name of Christ in vain. And you are told in the book of Exodus 3, verse 7, that we should not take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Calling ourselves Christians when indeed we are not Christians. We are not living by the principles of Christ. So this is a group of people who were there. And Christ said, I know them. Verse 10. He goes on to encourage this church that is going through persecution, that is going through 
a persecution that might be instigated or encouraged, that is instigated and encouraged by those who claim to be Jews, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. So he's speaking, he talked about persecution. This is a fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Christ then moves on to encourage them to fear none of the things that they shall suffer. Christ said that they would not, they should not fear them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 28, if you remember. He says, don't fear the one who can kill the body, but is not able to kill the soul. Fear the one who is able to kill the body or to destroy the body and the soul in hell fire. So this is the incredible that Christ is giving them. You are going to suffer this, but fear none of those things. Why should we not fear? Verse 8. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. I was dead and now I'm alive. Christ has the keys to the tomb. He can give life where there is no life. So, and he says that people should be faithful unto death. If you are faithful unto death, know that at the end, Christ will give you a crown of life. He will give you life. That is why the introduction is very, very important. How he introduces himself to the church is very, very important. How Christ introduces himself to you and me today is very, very important. We should be faithful to death, if needs be. Knowing that Christ will give us a crown of life. And when you look at history, many of them were cast into prison during this time. And those who facilitated their imprisonment were those of the synagogue of Satan. We read about them in verse 9. They were like Judas, who was a Satan among the disciples, and they ended up betraying Jesus Christ. So, and Christ told us that brother will go against brother, son-in-law against father-in-law, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, parents against their children, children against their parents. And we should not be offended. But what should we do? We should be faithful unto death. This is the encouragement that applies to you and I today. Be faithful unto death. And Christ will give you a crown of life. And Christ also told them that they will have a 10 day tribulation. Now, this is the Diocletian. Um, persecution that commenced in 303 AD and ended in 313 AD. Now, when he says that 10 days, you know, in Bible prophecy, the book of uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, and the book of Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, a day for year principle. So this Diocletian persecution started in 303 AD, or 303 AD, and ended in 313 AD. Exactly 10 years of these persecutions. And we read in Fox's Book of Martyrs that the fatal day fixed upon to commence the bloody work was the 23rd of February, AD 303, or 303. That being the day in which the Terminalia were celebrated and on which, as the cruel pagans posted, they hoped to put a termination to Christianity. On the appointed day, the persecution began in Nicomedia. On the morning of which the prefect of that of the prefect rather of that city repaired with a great number of officers and assistants to the church of the Christians, where having first opened the doors, they seized upon all the sacred books and committed them to the flames. The whole of this transaction was in the presence of the Elkishan and Galerius, who, not con contented with burning the books, had the church leveled with the ground. They destroyed the building. This was followed by a severe edict commanding the destruction of all other Christian churches and books, and an order soon succeeded to render Christians of all denomination outlaws. 
the outlaws were killed in prison. Verse 11, he continues with the encouragement. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. So Christ promises that those who are killed for his name's sake, for his name's sake, Father, will not be heard of the second death. They can only die the first death, but not the second death. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 20, verse 6, we see that only those who are holy will not suffer the second death. So the church of Smyrna, when Christ look at, looks at the church, they were a holy church, that they are not worthy to suffer the second death. Christ wants to see the same in us today. Christ wants to see people who are holy and not worthy to suffer the second death. And the only way for us to be holy is to take heed to his word, obey his word. We, our works, our tribulation, our poverty, and the spiritual uh, well being known by Christ. So that when he looks at us, he says, you are worthy of the crown of life. And you need to be faithful. You need to overcome. How do you overcome? We overcome the urge, the natural response to give in when persecution gets heated. We should not give in, friends. I'll close with these words. This is from the Review and Herald of November 22, 1898. In that day of final punishment and word, both saints and sinners will recognize in him who was crucified, the judge of all the living. Every crown that is given to the saints of the Most High will be bestowed by the hands of Christ. Friends, this is what is possible for you and I. To be crowned by the very hands of Christ. Those hands that cruel priests and rulers condemned to be nailed to the cross. He alone can give men the consolation of eternal life. And this is the promise that he's making to you and I today in the message to the church of men that if you are faithful unto death, if you are faithful unto the end, you will crown us, you will crown you, you will crown me with that crown of life. With his own hands, the same hands that were crucified. May God help us, friends. May God help you. May he help me to be faithful. May he bless us with his Holy Spirit. May he bless us with his grace to endure trial, to endure uh, temptations, to endure tribulations, and to increase our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends, for joining us. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Join us again in the afternoon a powerful message on health. God bless you.